All right, guys, so let me show you what I have today. We're going to be focusing on not only on looking at aesthetics, but also more focus on the coding side. And that's what I kind of decided to do from the from the previous video. So if you didn't watch the previous video, make sure you watch it because I went through most of the scenes and then you're going to get an idea of what we're going to be doing today. So which is going to be looking at the code. So let's go ahead and get going. So what I'm going to be doing is we're going to be looking at a couple of components that are really important. So I'm going to go ahead and open up VS Code and we're going to be looking at the organization that I have right now. Some of these might not make much, much sense if you haven't, you know, if you haven't done procedural generation and don't worry about it. There's no right or wrong answer. This is the way that I implemented. I'm sure there's a million ways or even better ways to implement something like this. This is what worked for me. So I hope that you get, you know, some ideas from what I'm about to show you. So right now, there's not a lot of code per se, but there's just a lot of uh, configuration and getting things going. And that's basically how most of the stuff are built is by using, you know, by using 3D models and then wiring up those 3D models to through the inspector, through the code. So the some of the main pieces that I'm going to that I'm going to recommend that you that you look at are going to be progen and also the progen randomizer. So these two classes are going to be the ones responsible for building everything. The randomizer is basically the one that tells the progen script what it needs to be, basically what needs to have a, as a parameter. And I'm gonna walk you through that. And then the progen, it's, it's basically the whole core. This is the one that builds the data structure and then it uses that data structure to build and position all the prefabs. So I'm also going to be looking at some of the models. I, I believe I showed you some of the models before, but I've been making a couple of changes. So everything starts, well, let me actually start on the room. So everything that I'm building, it's going to be a room. So a room is, like I said on a previous video, is composed of four walls. So I also have a class called walls and I initialize this value to four. So this is gonna be a property with a value with basically an array that has four walls to any, as, an, as an initial value. And then a room needs to have a position so that we can place, you know, that room somewhere in the building. We, I also have a property here that determines if this room is going to have a roof, if it's not going to have a roof. And this is something that I started working on and I'm not sure if I'm going to have it in the final version. And, and I know some of you asked me, Dermot, can I look at your code? And, 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 I, and I told you that the code is messy and, and it might be messy because there's a lot of things that I'm not, that I'm probably not going to have in the final version, but this is one of those. This is basically uh, an idea that I had for determining and, and having a room be aware of what is around. So, so think about something. Let me, let me go ahead and draw something because I think this, is, this part is really important. Let's go ahead and open up a sketch pad, show you what this is not going to be. This is not going to be pretty, but I'm going to try to make my best to make sure that it makes sense. So let's say that we have that it starts from here to here, right? We have a room and it looks, looks like something like this. It's just it's just gonna be represented by by a cube. And I'm just gonna draw this and we have, you know, something like this. And I'm drawing with my touchpad, so my, <laughs> this, is not, this is not perfect, but anyways. So you have a room, right? And these right here, it's, it's our room. And the, the room has, you know, four walls, and then, so, you know, we have wall number one here, we have wall number two here, we have, you know, wall number three here, and then this is wall number four. So that's what makes up a room. So the idea of having a room ray is that I can have a ray that sits somewhere in the middle, and then that ray can be aware of what's around this room. So let's say that I want to do a ray that goes all the way up, and, you know, we have a ray cast that if this room is about you know one about one on the on the scale then we know that if i go up 1.5 i'm going to be hitting i might be hitting something else so if i have a room right above me or if i want to do a ray that goes this way then this room will be aware of what's on the left and then this room will be aware of what's on the right or it will be aware of what's you know on the bottom and and, and this is okay. I mean, it's it's the, the thing that I don't like about it is if I do a room ray and now we have to worry about creating a ray and then actually having a mono behavior that is attached that actually controls that ray. And that's what I didn't want to do. I, I want the data structure to, 
to be smart enough to know, okay, I have a room above me, I have a room on the left of me, I have a room. So if we build a data structure in a way that, that it's easier to consume, then it's going to be more performant. So that's that's what I that's why this piece I'm not sure that I'm going to be using. So I'm just going to put the terming if I am going to be using this. And to be honest, I'm probably going to be using it because I don't I don't think it's going to be performant if I do this. But I'll show it to you anyways. And then a room will need to know what floor it has. So if it's on floor number one, if it's on floor number two, this is what it specifies that. And then this is just basically the constructor. I pass in the position. I have an optional parameter here, whether it's going to have a roof or not. So by default, rooms don't have roof. And then that's why I set it to false. And then by default, a room doesn't have array. And that's what I set that to null. Basically initialize everything that is in the object as part of this. And then I also have a property that allows me to return the actual position of the room. So that's what room is. So if we go into some of the the objects that room is using, such as the wall, we can look at what the wall is. And I show you this before as well. This is a wall type normal or or, or actual wall, wall type. I can't even say that word blank. And what this means, this is going to be just a wall that shows normally. And this is just going to be a wall that takes up, a, takes up a space, but it doesn't actually have a wall. I'm still working on, on some other wall types, but for now, that's what it is. And then I have an initializer and an automatic property here that sets it to normal. I have a vector position because we need to know where that wall is. And the reason why I did a private set here is because I don't want anybody from the outside of this class to be setting this. I want the wall to set itself and that's why I have a private setter. And then I also have the rotation of the wall and that's what we're using a quaternion in here. And I'm also passing it in and also the wall type is optional. So that's what the wall is. And then now if we look at floor, so the floor is going to be the one that has everything, right? So a floor has rooms and then a, a room on itself, it has walls. So that's what this is. The floor knows what floor it is. So if this is floor number one again, then I could have, I could have just keep this here and then have the room get it, get it from floor number. But I think, I think the way that I implemented it, it's fine, but you know, later on, like I said, I'm gonna clean it up. So I might get rid of the property that I have in room. And then I have a two-dimensional array on the on the room, and I'm gonna show you why that is as well. I on the previous videos I show you what this was, and let me just add some spacing in here. And the reason why I changed this from I think it was called it was actually called width and height. And the reason why I changed it to rows and columns is because I'm also dealing with cells. It's easier to think about, you know, think about a spreadsheet and a spreadsheet has a cell. And if you're looking at, you know, for cell, let's say the cell was, I think that rows was two and columns was two. And if you want to locate a cell, then you use the index from the row and the index from the column, and that will give you the position. So think about this, but we're transforming these from, from being something like, I think I need to do some drawing again. So think about, you know, we have, we have an X, and Y plane, so this is, you know, this is being X, and then, and I'm laughing because I, I did it the opposite way. So think about X and then and then Y here. So if we were to transform these on, on X, let's say that we, we transform these 90 degrees, then we're gonna have a flat, so I'm gonna try to draw a, a three-dimensional one. So we're gonna have something like this, right? So this area right here, and I'm not a mathematician whatsoever, this is just how I understand it, and we're going to have Y here, and we're going to have an X, right? But if we go up in in a floor, so this is going to be the floor. So so the way that I implemented it is X is now, we're talking about X as being rows, so I'm just going to denote it by R, and then Y is actually C, which is columns. So this is that equals that, and then this equals that. I'm going to get a, I'm going to get a Wacom tablet, I promise you guys. But for now, just just... You know, don't laugh about my doctor handwriting. <laughs> but anyway, so so X is a row, and then C is Y, which is a column. F is the floor. And then what we're drawing in here is just an X and Y coordinate. And just this piece right here is just if you were looking at it from a, a normal a normal orientation, where this is just, you know, if we're, if we're actually doing a building, the, the actual X and Y will sit flat, and then the floors will go up. So that's how I build the structure. So if you have, for instance, this is gonna be this is gonna be a two by two. 
So we have index zero here, index one here, and then for columns it's going to be index zero here, index one here, and, and then and so on. So if we go back here, this is going to be our x, this is going to be our y, and then floor number it's going to be basically our height. So makes sense for me doing it that way. If you don't think that's the proper way or you have a better way, let me know because I'm always curious about what you guys think about it. But anyways, when you when you initialize a floor, you have to pass in a floor number and also a two-dimensional array, which is the room. I also initialize the floor number. I basically initialize the rooms, which is going to initialize that variable. And then I also initialize rows and columns by using the, the private setter. So that, that's what floor is. Now let's look at room rate just pretty quickly, even though I'm not going to use it. I'm using it right now in code, but I'm not actually implementing the array. So, so right now, this was my idea of having array distance. So this will be what we were looking at right here. So if this was array, the distance between here and here, let's say this was the width of this was about, uh, and I can even I can even draw. This was about one. Then if we go up, you know, half of a block, that will be 1.5. So this is what I was thinking about using for array distance. If the vector three was vector three dot up and then the distance was 1.5, then we would be able to determine if we have basically a room sitting above us. So that's what the idea was here. I could also specify where to start the ray. So if I wanted to start the ray here, if I wanted to start it here, if I wanted to start it here, I could move the ray around the room and that will give me you know, some flexibility for checking what's around. I might do it at some point, but I, I'm not gonna use it to determine if I have neighbors. So that's what, that's what I don't wanna do. So that's what the models are. Let me now look at, let's go ahead and look at room component. And, and room component is, the reason why I have this component is because of the ray that I was showing you that I wasn't gonna use. And the way that this works is, I, I again, I have, this one is inheriting from mono behavior, and I need to do that because the rays are actually initiated, in, in actually created on the, on the update. So I have a ray distance, I have a ray position, so again, this one is going to translate to what I have on the data structure, where I have on my model. And the ray position is going to translate to the ray position here. So these two go pair by pair. Room component is more of a model behavior component. Room ray, it's going to be more of a data structure. And then I also have an offset just in case I want to move the ray around in addition to what I have on the ray position. And then I just had a heat, a heat generated. The reason why I did this is because I don't want to generate this ray cast every single frame. Otherwise, my the, the generation is, is never going to complete. It's going to be horrible on frames per second. So I, I store, as soon as I hit uh, my neighbor or I hit something, then I said that I hit, I actually generated the, I have a hit, and then I just basically don't do that anymore. So that's what this is. And then shell ray is just a debugging thing because I wanted to see the, the actual ray being rendered on the editor. So I did that. So if I set it to true, then I'm gonna see it, otherwise I won't see it. And then what I'm doing here, if I don't initialize, if this number is not more, it's not greater than zero, there's really no need for me to do a raycast because that means uh, I don't really care about any neighbors. And then as long as I haven't generated it either, I haven't generated a hit. So if the ray distance is greater than zero and I haven't generated a hit, I'm gonna create a, basically a null raycast hit. And I'm gonna call my physics the raycast. I'm gonna pass in the local position, subtract so the offset and then you know at the ray position and then i also do a transform direction on vector up i pass in my my null hit if i get a hit this is going to be pass it's actually going to have the value and then this is going to be my distance and then if i generated a hit and just set it to true and then we're good to go we know that we hit an actual neighbor so that was the idea with the room component now the the other piece that i also had that i'm not using is the the wall component and and I believe I'm, I might be using it. I actually can look and see. Oh yeah, I am using it and I'm gonna show you how I'm using it. So, and, okay, so that's that piece. I think I cover most of these ones. The the one that I wanna show you, I think the progen editor. Okay, so the project gen editor is very simple but it's pretty powerful. And if the way that I have it right now is this is an editor for this component right here, the progen. And I show you this previously again, I just gonna reiterate it. I basically, you know, it's an extension of progen. And this one, this is the one that is creating the, the actual generate button. So if we go back to Unity, 
I can show you how that looks like and then how cool it is, how easy it is to use it. So if I go to Unity and we look at we look at this, this is actually an editor for this whole thing, right? So the way that it works is you can see that I have a generate button. So that generate button gets created by this editor extension. I just say GUI layout that button generate and that creates that button. And then I just call into generate because I have a new instance here. Well, it's actually not a new instance. What happens is the target becomes the instance that the editor is wired to. So this is wired wired to progen. So as soon as progen gets generated, target is going to be set, and therefore the button is going to be created. It's going to be label generate, and then GUI that change means anytime I touch the GUI, I make a change to anything on the GUI. It's going to this if statement is going to get true, and then I'm going to call my generate. So this is super easy to implement, but it's actually really powerful. All right, so that's what progen editor is. Now let's go ahead and look at the progen randomizer, and then we'll look at progen last. So progen randomizer was, you know, the it's been it's been you know I've been adding more features to it. So right now I can say, okay, I want to randomize in these many seconds. I want to have a minimum and maximum of rows. So this allows me to, you know, if I do range, it allows me to have a slider pretty much, and then I can specify a minimum and a max. I set everything to one by default, but I change it through the by using the slider in the inspector. I have minimum columns, maximum columns, minimum floors, maximum floors, and you know as soon as I add more features to Progen, I'm gonna be adding more features to the Progen randomizer because I want this thing to basically create as many um, as many instances of a building as I can because I like to see variations and I think it's really cool to do it anyways. So I also do a mean cell unit size. So all this is is minimum and maximums for randomizing numbers. That's really every that's really what it's what it's doing to simplify. And then all I do here is I just keep track of a randomizer timer. I actually increment it by just summing time that delta time times one. And then as soon as I hit the max, which is going to be you know every five seconds in this instance, it's going to go through this code. So what's happening is gonna that, that we're gonna do because this is exposed, I can change how frequent this is going to execute, which is going to allow me to, to basically create random structures in runtime by attaching the script. So it's really cool, it's really powerful, it's really is actually not too complicated, but it makes things go go really fast because I can test a lot. So that in conjunction with the project editor are two pretty simple but powerful tools that I think if you're you know if you're building your own implementation, I would really recommend that you do something like this. So the last the last piece is the most important piece, right? Because so far we've just been looking at models, we've been looking at components, and we, we looked at a randomizer, but in the data structure, but we haven't really looked at what actually creates the whole thing. And and I show you that previously, but I changed it from the I think it was the first video that we started looking at the code. So I'm just gonna walk you through some of those changes. So roof prefabs now takes in an array, it used to be a single value. So now it takes in an array because I want to allow to randomize that as well. I also added a randomized roof selection because I don't want to just select one of these items. You know, the first item from the array, I want to be able to randomize what roof I select. So if you set it to true, it's going to randomize what we pick from this list. I also do the same thing with Windows. If I set this to true, the randomized window selection, we're going to be ch basically selecting a random window from the array. And if you set this to false, it's basically going to select the first item in the array. So just keep that in mind as you're using the tool because it's going to help you, you know, isolate different things. And if you don't want to be changing, you know, roofs, you just want to test one, you could change, you could set this to false and then just use that first item in the array as a test. I also have one door prefab right now, but I'm going to be changing it to use an array just like this. And I have another idea on implementing in here and I so what I want to do is I want to create another data structure instead of storing a game object array and then of prefabs I want to be able to do something like and this is for future and the reason I want to mention it because I know some of you want to build something like this so what I want to do is I want to build something like this it's going to be random item selection and this is going to be the name of the class and this is going to have also a so what, what basically is going to have is going to have a way. So this is going to be one one of the properties is going to be a game object. So this is going to be the actual prefab, right? 
and then we're also going to have a weight and the weight is going to be a number between 0 and 0 and 1 so we're going to go in percentage so let's say that the weight of this item was 0.1 and the so now that we have that data structure so this is going to be the we can call this one game object prefab i'm just thinking about a, a better name so we're going to say random item prefab and this is going to be this is going to be an object right so if i create an object like that then what i can do is instead of doing something like this i could do random item selection and it's going to be an array of those and what that's going to allow me to do is now i can do some math to calculate which item from that array i i can select and that allows me to do math against the weight so if the weight is greater then we have more chance to basically selecting that window versus right now that everything is the equal weight so if i have five windows what's going to happen is the randomizer is going to do its best to randomize a number from you know from the minimum into the max and then it's there's no really weight so if you want a window to show more then that way it's going to be greater so that that's kind of an idea for the future and then i'm just going to do here to do implement random item selection and okay so that's what that is window prefabs and then random window selection and then we're going to be looking at that in the future i might do it before the next video and, and then just show you how that works by the next video and then i also have a door prefab like i said this is going to be changing and then I also have properties whether to include a roof or not. And this one is going to allow us to determine if we need to keep inside walls or not. So the next thing that I wanted to show you is the window percent chance and also the door percent chance. So what this is telling the system is that we, in this case, this is 30%. So at least 30% of the time or less, we're going to get we're going to get a window. And then the same thing with the door percent chance is going to be at least 20% of the time we're going to get a door and the number if you increase this number we're going to get more doors so then the lower the number the less chance that we're going to get doors so that allow us to modify those numbers and then i also have a few options for the grid the number of rows number of columns i kind of explained that to you by using the sketch and then whether this is something that i added as well i didn't want it i didn't want this to be fixed i wanted these numbers to be random so if i want to randomize the rows i could randomize the rows if I want to randomize the columns, I could also randomize the columns. So I'm going to show you what that what that creates and, and how it actually affects the generation. So the the other thing that I also have is the cell unit size. I can specify, and this one allows me to kind of separate the buildings. It actually gives it a really cool look. Also, how many floors we're going to have, and I also have a slider, and I have a, basically an array of floors because we can have one floor, we can have two floors, and so on. And then on the awake method, I'll just call this generate. I also store the rooms because we need to dispose them. I need to change this because right now, if you, let's say that you create a building and I leave some, and I close Unity, come back to Unity, there the rooms that are gonna be created, but this doesn't get initialized until then. So I need to change how this works. So I'm just gonna, I gotta do to do fix a bug with creating rooms and unable to delete him i'll show you what that is but there is a bug that just i know what i need to do to fix it but i just haven't fixed it and then this just keeps track of how many prefabs we're instantiating so that i can label them correctly in the hierarchy so this is the one that does most of the work i clear everything i build the data structure and then render so this one builds basically all these components all the models in memory and then the render uses that information that is in memory to actually create the prefabs and then if this is set to true, we're going to remove the inside walls. If it's not set to true, we won't remove the inside walls. So a couple of changes in here that I've been doing. I This is this was already there. I didn't change my implementation. I just created an array of how many floors we have. I have a floor count that I initialize. And then I keep incrementing that as long as we, you know, we go through this loop. Then if we, and, and the, the reason why I increment that is because I'm, um, I'm um, initializing how many floors we have here. So if we have two floors, number of floors is going to go through this loop twice. So I need to increment the floor count so that we we basically set the appropriate floor. And I also initial I, I also need to set these initial rows and initial columns because these are going to be randomized. And I'm going to show you how that works. So I have a for each that go through the floors and then 
a for loop that goes through the rows, and then a for loop that goes through the columns. That's basically most of the most of the work. And then every time we go through a floor, I create an I pass in the initial rows and also initial columns. The reason why I do this this way is because we're randomizing this number. That way, if I go through another floor and that number is different, I don't use the same value of rows and columns. Otherwise, it won't be randomized. So I create a two-dimensional array by using using those two values. I loop through my rows, I loop through my columns, I basically set the room position, I get the room position by by calculating the vector three using these numbers, and then I get the I initialize my room, passing the row and the column, I initialize the room, passing the room position, which I declare here. I also have a variable here whether basically a ternary operator that determines whether I need to include a roof or not. And then you know if, if this is if this is not if this is true it's gonna do this if it's false it's gonna basically you know go to false and and then the next thing that I do is I set up all my four walls and this is this is something that I was playing around with that I think I ended up doing is if the randomized rows or randomized columns is set to true the the rooms are always going to have a, a roof and I'm gonna show you why that is. But just keep that in mind. If this is set to false, it's not going to have. Basically, it's, it's it's going to be determined based on this logic. Otherwise, it's always going to be true. And that's because sometimes some rooms are not you know symmetrical. I, I might have three floors, three rooms above me, but there's only two rooms. So what that's going to create is going to create a. It's actually going to create a, a room beneath it that it doesn't have a roof, and it's just going to look weird. And I'm going to show you that how that looks in just a minute. But anyways, I go and then create a create a floor and then initialize my floor count. Actually, passing the floor count to the index of floors, and then I create a new floor object and then I increment the floor count. I pass in the rooms, and then this is a, something that I started doing. I started adding rule because I'm going to be changing this as well. I'm going to have a rule manager that applies all, all these rules. So for now, what I'm saying is rule if a random column or row. Let's experiment with different values. And this is the random randomization of initial rows. If this is set to true, I'm going to randomize that value. If this is set to true, I'm going to randomize that value. And I'm going to go from one to rows and from one to columns. So this little code actually creates a cool effect. So that's what this is. Now, if we go to, to the next method, which is going to be the render. So we looked at this one, which is this one, and now render. So render is the one that creates most of the most of the objects that you see on the on the actual game. So again, I'm going to loop through floors. I'm going to also loop through rows. I'm going to loop through columns. In this case, I'm getting data from my floor object. So I'm getting my row and my column. I'm basically initializing the room that floor number, which I could have done over here. I don't know why I did it here, but anyways, that this this might need to change. I'll just say to do move this to. It's going to be build a structure method, and I won't change it right now because I think it's going to be distracting. But anyways. I initialize the floor number on the room, and then I create a room game object just to have everything organized in the hierarchy. I add this new object to my list of rooms, which I show you above, which is just a list of rooms. And then I add this room go, which is the game object I created to be actually a child of this object. Then what I what I do now is I check to see if the floor number is zero. If the floor number is zero, I'm going to be adding basically doors. So I only add doors on the first floor, and that's right now, and that's how I have it working. So later on, you might change. And then the next thing that I do here is I also have a rule here. It looks like I didn't do column in here. Let's just keep things consistent. And then I'm just saying here if Windows coverage percent is within the threshold at a window, otherwise at a basic wall, and that's basically what I'm doing here. If this is within within the Windows percent percent chance that we told the system to to look for on the randomization then and and we also have randomized selection set to true then i'm going to be selecting a window randomly otherwise i'm just going to be selecting the first window and then if we're not within the window percent chance we're just going to basically add a wall so that's basically how this works and the room placement is something that i added as well for placing you know for actually placing some of these objects so if i'm placing a window or if i'm placing you know, a different type of object, then I can go here and actually spawn them. So in this case, if I'm calling Windows Prefab, 
then I can basically just pass in the prefab and then I can position the prefab accordingly to, to these four calls. So, and the reason why I do it four times is because we need to actually place four walls. It could be, you know, some of these could be a window, some of them could be, you know, uh, an actual wall or, and I'm just looking at this right now and I think this needs to change because let's say that we, on one of them we place a window. I don't want to place a window four times and I think that's what it's doing right now. It looks okay, but it needs to be a window and then maybe a wall. It, it doesn't need, if we want, if we have a window that is inside, it's just going to look weird. But that's how it works right now. And then I also determine if the room has a roof or not. If it has a, if, if it has to have a roof, then I randomize the room selection. And then as you can see here, I'm looking at the max. So right now the, the rule is if we need to randomize a roof, this is only going to happen when we are on the top. So I'm not randomizing the roof on the other floors. I'm only randomizing it, randomizing the roof on the on the very top. And that's because some of the roof have like a water tank or I don't want to put, you know, on another floor a water tank because it's just going to look really strange. And then the other thing that I'm doing here is I'm also calling a spawn prefab. And this just basically responsible for, for instantiating the prefabs that I'm, that I'm telling the system. So that's how that works. And then remove inside walls is another method that I do, that I use to determine if walls need to be removed and then my clear method which I told you that I need to improve so anyways I know there was a lot and I probably went too fast and there were a lot of things that I that I still need to fix but this is the the beginning I have a lot of different ideas that I want to implement and, and obviously you can see that I have some to do's that I need to fix so hopefully this makes sense if you guys have any questions I hope I hope this was helpful and if you have any questions, please let me know. And also, make sure that you give me a thumbs up if you like this video because that's really going to help me in bringing you all more videos. Thank you very much, guys.